Welcome to the Lou Catino Show, where we can learn to reimagine our lifestyle. Seema, it's a pleasure to have you today on the show. Thank you so much for taking our time. I know how busy you are. And how do I know that? Because of your engagement with everyone, almost everyone who keeps interacting with you on social media. I see how you go out of your way to kind of personalize your responses and, you know, actually be there for people. So that's my assumption for you being busy, besides the fact of everything else that you do. So thank you for coming on our show today to inspire our audience. You know, ha they have a lot of questions. They have a lot of doubts, a lot of myths to be broken, not just about sex, about sexual wellness, you know, consensual sex, boundaries, and even Kama Sutra. These things are highly misunderstood by most people. And I always believe that when we bring knowledge and understanding, people can change their perception towards looking at sex with a different light, looking at erectile dysfunction differently. Failures in the past and sexual relationships can't be limitations for new love in your life. So thank you for being with us on this particular show. And I would like to start straight off by asking you, tell us how you got into this. You know, I know you've been doing studies and you've done so much of work in London. I know also that you are the influence of the year when it comes to sexual wellness, although I would like to change that from an influencer to an inspirer, because I actually think you inspire more than you influence. So over to you. Oh, thank you, Luke. That is so sweet. Um, so like you said, that, you know, there is just so much that goes on in our minds and we kind of tend to put it into boxes and say, well, this is the sexual wellness category. This is my meditation category. This is my some other category. In actual fact, we are a conglomerate. We are, we are a collection of stories. I believe that we're not a collection of molecules. We are a collection of stories as human beings. And it is the stories that, tell, that we tell that define us. They define how other people see us and how we see ourselves. And I actually got into this because I believe this, that um, stories are the most powerful tool of influence. The stories that we tell, you know, when you go around telling the story of what you expect a good woman to be, the silent, self-sacrificing one, then that's the identity you've taken on. You know, in which case then the moment you stand up for yourself, you become the bad woman, you become the fishwife and so on. So I think um, I started working on stories because I really wanted to see, I wanted to explain to people what is the power behind these stories that we're telling ourselves constantly. And gradually, as I worked on the stories, I realized that we never, ever tell stories of a woman's right to her own body. Her body is always somebody else's property. You know, her pleasure, her body, it always belongs to somebody else. And that's where I got into this particular field of trying to look for those stories that we shut down, because every story that we ever tell tells a woman how to think about her pleasure, how to think about sexuality, what she should be doing at whose instigation, at what time. It's, it's like seeking permission for yourself. So I went into it to understand what are the stories that we shut down so I could bring those stories back to people, give them autonomy over their own lives, give them agency over their own body. Wow. Wow. And you also did a lot of work with Kama Sutra in terms of studying and, you know, retelling those stories in such a simple language and, you know, the work that you've been doing in London as well. I'd love to know a little bit more about that in the space. Yeah. So, um, you know, the Kam Sutra, as most people don't seem to understand, is um, so it's a book written in seven sections and it was written to teach men how to live the ideal life. So it wasn't actually written for women at all, because in the 300 and something AD when it's written, women were not taught how to read or write. So it's a book written for men and it's written in seven sections. The first section is about how a man should build his house, how he should decorate it, how many hours he should spend getting himself massaged before his bath, how many hours he should spend talking to his birds, his parrots and his minor birds and so on. You know, So it's all about how the man should be living his life. The second section is about pleasure. The third section is about how to go about looking for the ideal wife who should be in your life, which is a really interesting thought. The next one is how to marry this woman. The next one, the next section, section five is on how to seduce another man's wife. 
um, the six, yeah, well, you know, it's all politics, right? Because if her husband is really important, then you might need his favors, in which case, this is one way of get, going about it. So it was about the politics and seduction. Um, mm -hmm. The sixth section was about the rules around courtesans, because this is written at the same time, we think, as the Archastra. And the Archastra, which is written by Chanakya, Chanakya uh, had created a, uh, for his rulers, a kingdom where they had um, legalized prostitution. And so there was a ministry for it. There were ministers, there were rules, there were laws, there were taxes to be paid, etc. And so apparently uh, we are told in the introduction to the Kam Sutra that the courtesans say we're very confused. Can you write us a chapter which sort of puts it in point form? So that's what the sixth chapter is about. And finally, the seventh chapter, which is a really pointless, very stupid chapter. It's on uh, magic potions and lotions. Okay, oh. it's a load of nonsense. It's about, you know, take a peacock's eye and put it into the urine of a goat and then, you know, that kind of nonsense. Um, means nothing at all, but we believe that as time went on, suddenly this idea that you have you have a book around um pleasure especially with such a large section on pleasure even though it wasn't the first and the only book um on this but we believe that this was added a little bit later to underline the fact that it was a scientific treatise mm -hmm. so these recipes and remedies were introduced um and so that's what the kam sutra is about the interesting thing for me, the only relevant chapter for me is section two, which is the arts of pleasure, because that's the only thing that still pertains to us today. And what is fascinating about this chapter, Luke, it's the only place for a book that's written for men where both men and women are addressed. So it's not about a man has to do this to the woman to bring her pleasure, or the woman has to do this to the man to bring him pleasure. It's about what gives a man pleasure and what gives the woman pleasure. And a huge amount of emphasis is put on the pleasure of a woman. It is quite extraordinary. And I believe that two things. One is that, you know, um, a lot of people don't know this, but they think that the Kam Sutra is a book about positions. Positions is a tiny chapter. The Kam Sutra actually doesn't mention the act of sex. So it mm -hmm. talks about pleasure, talks about intimacy, but like the ancient Chinese texts or the ancient Japanese texts that talk about how many thrusts you should have before you're allowed to uh, ejaculate, how much semen should come out of you when you, none of this is in the Kam Sutra. It mm -hmm. doesn't talk about pleasure, doesn't, I mean, doesn't talk about thrusting, doesn't talk about semen, it only focuses on pleasure. So I think that the ancient um, erotic texts of ancient India were written by women because it is wow. so focused on the aesthetics of pleasure, not just pleasure, but how beautiful it is. Wow, no, that's amazing. And so I'll lead into the next question that talks about today, a lot of people, they look at sex very differently. I mean, there's there are people who look at sex just as pleasure and they don't know intimacy. And there are people who are always looking at enhancing sexual pleasure. So, you know, a lot of people say that, hey, you know, how can Kama Sutra be used? Or maybe this particular chapter, because it makes so much more sense now. How do we use it? Because now I figured it out. It's not about just looking at a position and saying, okay, I'm going to try that tonight. You know, how can we use Kama Sutra in our own lives to enhance sexual pleasure and intimacy? What would your advice be on that? Yeah. So, you know, so this particular section is broken up into lots of little tiny chapters. One of the nicest chapters, now let me tell you this, you know, these days, uh, I'm sure you get a lot of people, I get a lot of people writing to me about how the male partner has erectile dysfunction, or they have so much stress that they cannot actually um, enjoy their lovemaking, and so on. So there's a lot of issues. We keep trying to say to people that pleasure, intimacy, even sex, is not just an act of the body, it starts over here in the brain. You know, our genital organs are smart organs. They know what is going on in the rest of your body. If you have any form of illness, mental, physical, anything, any disorder, 
your genitals will pick it up. Your sexual organs will react to that. If you are unhappy in your brain, you can be with the most good looking partner. You can be with somebody that turns the whole world on. You can be looking like a million bucks yourself. Your, your sexual um, interaction will not be pleasurable. Right. Because if you're unhappy in here, you cannot get pleasure down there. So our genitals are smart organs. You know, uh, one of the very interesting things that the Kama Sutra has okay. is it says there's a chapter on the stories that you tell before sex and after sex. So it says that before you begin foreplay, before you even start, you sit down together on a sofa and you start, or whatever furniture they had in those days, obviously, um, you start to tell each other either naughty stories, funny stories, or gossip. And wow. the idea of this is that you distract the mind. You know, you come to your bedroom carrying all of the burdens of the day. You've got the stress of what went wrong in, in, at office. So-and-so said this to you, I'm angry. Oh my God, I'm so tired. I, I was cooking all day, et cetera, et cetera. You bring all of your burdens and your baggage with you. You make your bed the most unsexy place in the world because you're carrying all of that to your bed. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here is a book that's telling you 2000 years ago that you have to change your mental space. You have to transition before you can go into pleasure and intimacy. It's not an automatic kind of like, okay, I've come into the bedroom now, let me chuck off my clothes and I'm gonna have sex with you and everything's gonna be wonderful. It doesn't work like that. So it actually starts by saying anything that will actually change your mental space. So if it's a naughty story, something that makes you gasp and go, no, that's not true, you know, or whatever. Or when you share gossip, when you gamble and when you gossip, it's the two times when you forget the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So literally, it's about changing your head. It's about giving mm -hmm. yourself time to transition. Second thing, I, we'll come back to this. I know you want to ask me something about this. But the second thing is, it tells you, what do you talk about after sex? At this point, your stories are very different. You tell stories of couples who got together and lived happily ever after. How wonderful it was. You know, it was a good thing that they got together because when you finish, particularly for a woman, her orgasm depends on what happens after sex, how loved she feels after sex. And how she feels after sex will define how quickly she comes back to your bed the next time. <laughs> so it is so, so important. I mean, look at this. This is what I mean. Uh, we have so much to learn from this text. Wow. So basically mental foreplay before physical foreplay. I get that. No, I like I, I like what you said about that because it's setting the whole context. So I think that's where the candles come in, the mood lighting, and of course, making conversation. So that creates a distraction. Now, what I like about what you really said, because when we look at our patients who come to us with infertility issues, and believe me, a majority of them, we've just said, just move out of the city, okay, make love on a holiday and stuff. And it's it's unbelievable. They conceive, and it's only because of stress levels. And we also, Seema, you know, uh, we've come across women who have multiple miscarriages. Now, there could be many, many reasons for miscarriages, but sometimes when we talk to them, now I ask a question directly, do you want this child or did you want that child? And you will be surprised at how many women said, I didn't want it. Rejection in the mind that I believe the reproductive system is so intelligent to kind of literally conform to what a woman feels deeply in her heart and in her mind. So I completely relate with what you're saying about this. Uh, that, that's super interesting, but I want to go back because I was definitely going to ask you that question later about the orgasm. So much of misconception, so many men out there, their only target is, you know, did you orgasm? Did you orgasm? Did you orga orgasm? A lot of them don't know the difference between a woman orgasming or a woman coming. So in the simplest way possible from your experience, because I've seen how you story tell through all of these difficult topics, you know, and a lot of women feel guilty because, you know, we counsel them. They say, oh, we don't know if our man is happy. And I say, why? I said, because we don't know 
uh, we don't know how to orgasm and he wants an orgasm or I don't even know. So how do we educate men and women about orgasming? What's the difference between an orgasm for a woman? Sometimes a woman may just come, but she may not orgasm. So I would love for you to break this whole misconception out there. Yeah. So um, a lot of people say, how long should foreplay be? You know, it's the same sort of thing, right? The Kam Sutra actually says that a woman should be brought to orgasm twice before you penetrate her. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, because it says that women take so much longer to come to that point of orgasm um, that it's really not possible. I mean, one of the things, again, that the Kam Sutra says in the introduction is that men and women are so different in their pleasure the way that we feel pleasure, the way that we feel aroused, I mean, what brings about our pleasure and the way that it manifests in our body is so different. And yet we put a man and a woman together and we say, now go have sex and let it be the best thing in the world. You can't just fall into each other's arms and expect there to be fireworks and everything is gonna be brilliant. I haven't taught anybody anything about relationships. We haven't ever taught people how they should go around being with each other. We haven't even taught them that their bodies are completely different, but we expect them to go and have sex together randomly, jump around, have orgasms and be absolutely fabulous. And it doesn't work. Mm. So women very, very, very seldom will have an orgasm during penetration. It's mm -hmm. just the way that our bodies are constructed. The counterpart to the penis is not the vagina. You know, mm -hmm. if that is the male sexual pleasure organ, the vagina is not the female sexual primary pleasure organ for women. It is the clitoris. So there's a, I mean, like, you know, if you are actually penetrating deep into the vagina, the clitoris, which is the, the primary pleasure organ is not being stimulated. Mm. You can't really expect the same sort of thing. You know what I mean? Like it's, we're just doing this all wrong. And this is all thanks to Freud. Uh, Freud who in, uh, said, I mean, he destroyed, he created dysfunction for like, I don't know, it's gonna be thousands of years before we managed to ruin it, um, overturn it. He said that the only thing that counts is a penetrative orgasm. Anything else is juvenile. A mature woman should only feel pleasure through penetration. And so you have a whole set of generations of men feeling guilty because they can't bring their woman to pleasure and generations of women feeling guilty because they cannot orgasm. Something yeah. is wrong with us. You know, just that one little thing. Just imagine. So we keep saying to people, change your definition of sex, number one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Penetration is not necessarily the definition of sex. Sex is so many different things. It can mean different things to everybody. Secondly, women orgasm through a million different ways. A million different ways. Every part of your body every part of your body is an erogenous zone. It just depends on how you treat it. You can orgasm from anywhere that you want. It depends on how you treat it, okay? So these are things that have to be learned. Unfortunately, we cannot fall into bed and just start thrashing around and you know, feeling that we, we can just be there. But I'll tell you what is the real problem. It's this deep set insecurity, because that's what we've been taught. So it's a deep set um, rejection of any new information. Personally, even somebody like me who has been working on this for so long, you know, I would feel this pressure each time I was with my husband. And you know, it's a natural thing for your partner. Your partner is about to come. They want to make sure that you are pleasured as well. It's not like they're trying to do something bad, you know, they're, they're asking you, have you come? It's only now that I have learned in recent years to say, today is not about orgasm. Today is about me feeling pleasure in a different way. But mm -hmm. I have to first understand what is pleasure for me. Somebody else can't tell me. I wow. have to know. It's my responsibility to know that, yes, even just having... Um, him inside me, even just feeling that 
you know, that whole movement of us being together, it fills me with a certain kind of satisfaction. It fills me with a deep sense of um, comfort. It feels good. For me, that is pleasure. I don't need to tick a box and get a trophy and say, hey, this is what happened. You know what I mean? Like, I... We just need to understand that pleasure is not a bad thing and that we all have pleasure and you have to figure out what your pleasure is. Wow, Seema, thanks. That's that's really large of you to share an example like that. And I think that's why you're amazing at what you do because it just comes out, you know, the essence of, you know, everything you speak about comes out from such a real place in you. And that's felt all over. And this is the first time I'm talking to you. I feel it so deeply. But thank you for that, because it takes the pressure off a lot of men who are willing to change their thinking. The important point was this was a new one for me as well. It's like mindsets are programmed. And if men and women are not willing to give up limiting beliefs like this, like it's so reassuring to know that pleasure felt by a woman can be in so many different ways and men don't have to hold up to that whole thing of a tick box orgasm and that they should be allowed to feel their pleasure as well. So that's something huge. Thank you so much for sharing that. And Absolutely. Yeah, and I, like I said, I, sorry, just to reiterate that, you know, this idea that bring the woman to orgasm. To, women can come to orgasm through many different ways. And sometimes those other ways are much quicker. You know, the arousal takes much longer. Um, mm -hmm. But like somebody really enjoys being kissed on the neck, that can actually bring you to orgasm really, really quickly, be it a small one, a big one, whatever, but there are certain things that really can get women going. So do it twice. And then when you get down to penetration, it really takes the pressure off you because as a man, we also know that you can only last this long. And quite honestly, I do get letters from people look saying, oh, I was in her for an hour and a half. Then she said, I'm very scared. Like, okay, first of all, no woman wants you thrusting away inside her for an hour and a half. Trust me, it is not pleasurable. It is anything but. Secondly, if she's saying to you at the end of it, oh my God, I'm feeling a burning down there. Again, that's not pleasurable. That's a bad thing. So um, yeah, it's just, like you said, take the pressure off yourself and understand sex is many, many different things. No, that's amazing that you mentioned that because I, I recently had a client and who was explaining the fact, I mean, he was like, they were having problems in their relationship and the wife suffering from a particular condition. And either way, he was like, oh, I, I found I found out that my wife, uh, she had come in her panties and she had an orgasm without me. So is she cheating on me with her thoughts? And, you know, we got something like that. So I tried in my best way to explain the difference between orgasm and that a woman can come and get wet like men can also have nightfalls and all of that stuff. But what's your best definition in simplicity to tell people the difference between an orgasm and coming and that it's okay for women to naturally get wet? It doesn't have to mean they have sexual thoughts and sometimes they can have the same way men get hard with random thoughts. I'd love for you to throw some light on that, please. Okay, so, you know, this, okay, this idea, um, about the woman having these thoughts without me. And we always say that fantasizing is the best thing that you can do for your sex life. You know, because truly you cannot do the same thing. Your bodies are limited. You know, our body can only do so much. It is really important in order to keep it fresh to fantasize. The difference comes when you are using that fantasy to escape what you feel with your partners so that you can feel something different and still be okay and just kind of deal with that partner. Or you're using that fantasy to enhance what you're feeling with your partner. So, right. you know, that's the line. It's a blurry line, but you know, it's a line. Um, you know, women particularly, like with guys who have nightfalls and it's a natural instinct. Girls even before they realize that they're doing this, there's a tendency for girls, we um, discover very early in life that if you squeeze your thighs together and you hold your wee, it makes you come. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's very pleasurable because it puts a certain amount of pressure on the clitoris. And girls actually grow up doing this without even realizing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's an automatic sort of thing, you know, um, every now and then you will just literally squeeze your thighs together 
it's very quick. You're not thinking about anything. This is one time when at any other time, if I have to pleasure myself, I have to go into fantasy. I have to think about certain things in my head um, and so on. But this is one time when it's really, really quick. You can squeeze your thighs together, get that sensation, and you feel the pleasure. So just like men have nightfall, just like men have involuntary erections and involuntary ejaculation sometimes, sometimes it's a physical visual thing, you know, they see something, but it's involuntary basically, it just happens. In the same way, women have this involuntary instinct. And as you get older and you learn about it, you can decide if you don't want to do it and you uncross your legs and you stop yourself. But like I said, this is actually something that we're almost born with, you know, little girls grow up doing this. And yeah. it's something that you learn that you have to hide. Because I mean, I remember as a very young child, knowing somehow that this gave me a lot of pleasure, but nobody else was going to think it was okay around me. Um, so it's just something that we do. I, I, it's so natural. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Because if I can have to leave with my example, I have a lot of moms who notice the be this behavior in their daughters. And my daughter, when she was, I think, six years old, she would sit cross her legs. And, you know, my wife and I figured it out. And we didn't want to spoil the fact that we wanted her to understand that. So we just taught her to do it in her room or, you know, when not in public places and common places, because, you know, men can perceive it in a different way. But it's so common because we reached out to ask, is this normal? And so many moms said, hey, all our girls do this and stuff. But yeah, so thank, thanks for talking about that. But I want to I move back to sexual communication because everything you say comes down to almost like, you know, how do we improve sexual communication in our relationships? Because, you know, some of the, some of the most hottest couples, when I say hottest, they're all over, page three everywhere, all of them. Their sex lives, they're, they're very limited because the wife says, look, I can't express you know, my fantasies of what I would want with my husband because he'll think I'm a slut. And the guy says, oh, I can't express my sexual fantasies or communicate with my wife after she's had a kid because now I see her as a mom. I don't see her as my single wife or my, you know, hot girlfriend anymore. So sexual communication is something where everyone can evolve. So I, I would love your take on this and some advice on how people can, even in girlfriend, boyfriend relationships, whatever relationships, it doesn't matter. How can we you know, improve sex, sexual communication, especially in a, in a world where we've already been fed like myths, which you've just busted so many in our head thinking about this. Yeah, what's your advice on that? Okay, so the most basic thing, like you said, and clearly um, something that we talk about, but it doesn't really work is like you said, communication. We say to people, talk to each other. Don't think of it as taboo. But the problem is that there's so much stigma attached to everything. You know, like you said, the moment you say it, um, there is this thing that, oh, you know, imagine if you wanted that. This guy wrote to me saying that his girlfriend um, had asked him to do what they call a facial finish, where he, she wanted him after sex to come on her face. And uh, he wrote to me saying, I don't know how to explain to her that I will not be doing this. This is terrible. She doesn't know what she's asking for. Uh, she's just watched porn and she thinks that she knows, but people watch porn. This is demeaning. According to me, this is demeaning to women. I won't do it. And, you know, the first reaction of people is what a sweet man. Like he's mm -hmm. thinking of his girlfriend and not wanting to demean her. But in actual fact, here is a man consciously saying to the girl who has said, actually, I want to try this. The guy is saying, no. You yeah. can't because this is wrong. This is disgusting. This is slut behavior. I just mm. had a message where I was actually going, I'm going to do a um, post on it. This girl said that she's with her boyfriend and um, she decided to give him um, oral sex. And she said, I didn't know how to do it. So I watched porn, learned from there and did it for him. And he said to her, only prostitutes suck dick. Mm. And she said, what have I done wrong? I thought this was supposed to be nice for the guy. Like, so she's left confused. He has decided to just, I don't know, like put her down. And I don't understand why, why people do this. But yes, there is this, um, there's a stigma 
attached to fantasy. And mm -hmm. like when I was younger, I'm now I'm going to be 61 this year. So when I was younger, there was a whole different idea on how you approach sexual pleasure. So only fast girls enjoyed it. Okay, you you were a bad girl if you had fun. Everybody had to have sex when you got married. You had to have sex, but you couldn't have fun. That was the the defining line. Okay, so there that hasn't gone away, unfortunately, because a lot of the younger people, Gen Z, let's say, um, their parents are my age, right? So we grew up with this. It's the same thing that's being passed down to the next generation. We have a real problem about sexual communication. It's not just about whether they will think it's bad. A lot of people also write to me saying that I've tried communicating to my partner. He or she won't listen. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I find um, either it's seen as very hard work because if you, as let's say as the man, you're not used to putting in so much effort into pleasuring your female partner, why would you start now? It is hard work. So a lot of them don't want to listen. A lot of them are carrying a lot of other stress. They don't want to get involved with this. It's the last thing on their mind. A lot of them now have access to porn. So why go through the hassle of doing this in real life when you can watch something and jerk off to it? A lot of the women won't listen either because they're like, this is boring. This is painful. This has become a chore for me. I just don't want to do it. I'm uninspired. And that causes a further breakdown of the relationship. And you know how you started uh, by saying that you tell people to go on holiday and you actually start from that point. That's what I've started to say now to people is that if your communication with each other isn't working, try a really tiny fantasy, mm. a really small fantasy. Go off on holiday, be this. A lot of times I cannot even actually say to people, you know, get into this particular outfit, play this role with each other. Most people are even too nervous to do that. So forget about all that. But find a place that has some kind of um, fantasy connotation. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it is from a Bollywood film, a Hollywood film, James Bond film, whatever. Go to that space that geography helps. According to the Kam Sutra, different women get aroused in different types of geographies better. So some women will find the seaside more exciting. Some women will get more aroused if they're up by, by the mountains, etc. So that's one thing, a small, tiny, tiny fantasy to start with, if that helps and if they can actually do that. It's just about breaking down that first set of barriers. And if you can actually get to that point. The other interesting thing that we have um, from the Kam Sutra, which is worth trying. So in the Kam Sutra and the following literature over thousands of years, we never ever talk about the position by the name of the position. We talk about it through a piece of jewelry. So for instance, mm -hmm. women were taught how to do a particular thing by wearing, by how the jewelry moved on their body. And one of my favorite examples is how women in ancient times across the world were not supposed to be on top during sex. Okay, that was a taboo position for women. So the Kam Sutra says that women could be on top, but for this, you only have to move your hips. You don't move the rest of your body. Okay, so you don't jump up and down. You just move your hips. So they would wear like a jingling girdle around their waist, with lots of gungrus, and make sure that the gungrus didn't make a sound. Oh. Okay, so oh. I call this the goddess fancy, or, you know, the princess fancy, whatever you want to call it. But, you know, try that. Use a piece of jewelry. Actually, have fun with it. Play with it rather than... So the sitting position, for instance, you have to get this right. You wear a seven-string necklace of pearls and you have to move in such a way that the necklace moves from side to side slowly. It doesn't jump up and down. It just moves slowly from side to side. So it gives your partner a glimpse of your breasts. So if you find that you cannot do any other kind of fantasy or role play 
because you feel awkward, try a piece of jewelry. Thread flowers into your hair and see if you can shake them out as you make love. See if you can shake your hair free of the, the plait. You know, little things like that, really tiny things that you may not even tell your partner, but you are doing it and you know you're doing it. Because as I said, um, pleasure is fantastic when it's shared and when your partner enhances it for you. But the main thing has to come from within you. Nobody else can do that for you. It has to come from inside you. Uh, read erotic literature. Go and listen to erotic podcasts. Turn yourself on. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the power of fantasy. Role play. Yeah. Yeah, that makes so, so much of sense. That's the power of role play without actually making it role play because a lot of people are very shy for, um, about doing that. Right. You touched upon pornography and, you know, I need to touch upon that as well, because I know it's ruined a lot of men who've not been able to consume that content responsibly. And one of the reasons why they have erectile dysfunction, you know, stress may be a reason, sometimes medication, conditions like high blood pressure, but the overconsumption because they started benchmarking their performance in bed against pornography. But, you know, Seema, it was interesting because about I think a year before the lockdown, I was consulting with a lady who's a director of, you know, pornography and, you know, porn. And she was sharing an interesting fact. She was saying that, at least I'll talk for the Indian subcontinent, because she spoke about that data, about women consuming pornography. But she said, look, you know, that's okay. We all do. But the kind of pornography. And she said the percentage of women consuming, uh, what did she call it? I mean, it was really a harsh word. She said rape porn or gang banging, like very violent pornography was consumed by a lot of women, which actually tried, you know, which I actually kind of made me think. And I started going into a little bit of research. Like, I mean, women can enjoy what they want, men can, but where is that coming from? From which part of the mind? What is the need that needs to be filled? Is it just pleasure? Is it, I don't want to say dominance, but, you know, because dominance is real and a lot of pleasure for men and women. But why would it be that particular pornography for a very large population of women that kind of, it was the, it had the most hits. Let me put it that way. So I want you to talk a little bit about, about pornography, the psychology, how it can affect us. Like you spoke about soft, I mean, you spoke about erotica, which is absolutely great. But where do people draw the line? And in today's world, especially where people have access to it more than any before, there are still failed relationships at sexual levels. There's the inability to build intimacy and people can't stick with one partner, you know, for a while because they get bored. Like, like, you know, oh, I've done all of this with this girl or this guy. Now what's next? So the thrill for something more than a twosome, threesome or, yeah, I'd love your take on pornography, please. Okay. So as we, let's start with this first point. Um, fantasies are fantasies. It is a fantasy. It doesn't mean that a lot of people who fantasize about certain things would actually want to do that in real life. I met somebody who said that their ultimate fantasy was uh, jumping from a plane and having sex midair. And they admitted that they would never actually want to do that, but it was great in the head, you know. So fantasy is fantasy. I unfortunately cannot say any more than I can't comment anymore on this idea of the um, rape porn, rape porn fantasy, because I, I don't have enough um, data on why, beyond the fact that, you know, there are certain fantasies that um, people go through. And I'm not qualified to talk about that. So I'm going to leave that one aside. Porn as it goes, is really, really problematic for me because of various things. I realize it's the only thing that people have with which to learn. It's also their only outlet. And when I was younger, we had very limited porn. So um, when I was very young, we had there was uh, The Godfather, you know, the book, The Godfather. Yeah. The three pages yeah. in that which have a scene um, yeah. Of, yeah, two people having sex. It was the most read three pages, like every day, mm -hmm. you know, you'd help yourself to those three pages. I look at it now and you're like, this is nothing. But at that point, that was it. Um, a friend of mine used to get magazines from Germany 
So we had German magazine, which showed a certain kind of pornographic image. And much later, I think when I got into college, um, VCR videos had started to filter in from America with pornography. And I still remember, you know, a friend would every now and then say, Acha so and so, Kighadake, you know, we watch together. And it was vile, but we all watched one or two to understand that it was vile and you didn't want it. What makes me wonder about it is the people who watch it and think it's fantastic. So it's not, we watched it, everybody watches it at some point, and then you kind of go, oh, I'm going to throw up. So mm -hmm. what makes you get? past that, you know, where you desensitize so much that you start thinking, this is exactly what I want to consume. Um, the problem also with porn is, and like I said, I, I thoroughly recommend audio erotica. Mm -hmm. Now, whether you want to change the word and call it audio porn, um, whatever it is that you want to call it, I recommend audio erotica. I re recommend the written word because it leaves your imagination to do a lot of the work. So you're mm -hmm. still having to work at it with something visual in, in front of you it's just a basic um it's like a surfeit you know it's like stuffing your face with a chocolate cake then throwing up it's it's like that so i just think that it's really really bad for you because it destroys various nerve endings for want of a better word um and it also makes it so much easier you know it's like you don't have to do any of the work. If you're sitting over there, you put on this video, you jerk off to, you haven't done any work. When you're with another person, think of how much work you have to put in. They're in a different mood. You are in a different mood. You have to get to this point. How long will it take before you feel or they feel that the kissing or the, the necking or the love bites have got to this point before you take off your clothes? And you know what I mean? It is so much work. So a lot of people have just decided that, yeah, we're not going to bother with the work. It's just not worth it. And I just want to say that I think that, unfortunately, yeah, it is. I mean, it's bad enough that, okay, it sort of made people think about, I still get people writing and saying, why can't I last as long as they do in porn? Because you idiot, you can't, you know, I'm sorry. That, that's a very basic this thing you keep saying that yeah. is a film do you not understand um you get people saying um you know but she doesn't look like or he doesn't look like they do mm. in the films and you keep saying that's because that's um photoshop but aside from the visuals of it i think the biggest problem is the work that goes into it if you look at the sex industry with ai today you know, in America, in San Francisco, there is this um, there is this company making sex dolls that are fifty thousand, sixty thousand dollars. People buy those. You know, you can also just buy the torso. Like you can literally, if you can't afford the whole doll, you just buy the torso that has the vagina. Most of them are female sex dolls. Okay, so you buy a sex doll for that much. What are you going to do with it? A lot of these people actually make this their full-time partner wow okay there are people who married their sex dolls and to me the biggest issue around this is forget the kink and so on imagine mm -hmm. this thing that has been created only to pleasure you yeah. it has no argument it has no feelings it has no mm -hmm. uh, point of reciprocation nothing think of what it does to your brain when you get used to having sex with a sex toy it leaves you absolutely unequipped to be with another human being in any shape or form just imagine it's scary it's a scary thought again you know the kam sutra has this very interesting um thing on oral sex, it's the longest chapter, by the way, in the book is on oral sex because it the Kam Sutra has a very strange relationship with oral sex. It sort of says it's very pleasurable, but it's not good, but yes, it's good, but no, it's not good, and back and forth. And it says basically that if you are going to ask a woman to perform oral sex on you, it has to be reciprocal. You have to yeah. be prepared to do it back for her. So 
don't ask a woman to do it. You pay your male servants to do it for you. Yeah. Um, and it says that if you do that, if because they're being paid, they will not expect you to do it back for them, but they will feel very excited. And all you need to do in return is you can tweak their nipples a little bit to help their excitement. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like even over here, I find that particular chapter a little, or that particular set of instructions problematic, but this was 2000 years ago. You'd think we'd have come a little bit further, right? Um, but it does say that if you're going to do this with another partner who is your partner, not a paid person to do it for you, then you need to do it back for them. Yeah. And I think that's what porn has taken away from us, that it is very much about you and yourself. And it kills off the need to worry about your partner. You know, like it kills off any human instincts. Yeah. And that's yeah. the problematic bit. Yeah, so it makes someone selfish and not emotionally available, which means you can't create intimacy. And it makes you less human. Yeah. Wow. Or it makes you dangerously less human because now suddenly you're like, uh, yeah, this happened. You then think that, and forget about in bed, forget about sex. You get used to that. Eventually that filters down to every other relationship. Hmm. Wow. Wow. Thanks for explaining that. And, you know, I want to touch upon the topic of sex toys. What I, It's a vast topic, but I have a very specific question. When I was in New York with a patient and then we were speaking to the doctor later, she was a gynecologist that was for an ovarian cancer. She was, she just mentioned to another doctor that, you know, Luke, uh, this particular patient, she's oversensitized her genitals. And I was like, can you please explain that to me? Because I just jumped into the conversation, you know, uh, midway. So she was talking about the, the family. I mean, the husband and wife were having problems, intimacy, and she felt all the emotional, you know, uh, things that women feel when they feel rejected by a man emotionally or physically. So apparently she started using sex toys. And to the extent where the gynecologist said she has oversensitized the genitals, which means no one now can pleasure her better than the toy. And she was saying that this was becoming a huge issue. We're all for sex toys. It's great. But you have to draw a boundary there as well. Because after a while, no one can. And then, you know, her partner who tried to, they were going through counseling, was trying to make, you know, make amends and trying to get physical. But he couldn't. And he started to feel that I'm not good enough and all of that stuff. So I would love for you to talk about sex toys, the blurry line that exists between them and how men and women can kind of keep it in place, like boundaries. I love how you talk about drawing boundaries and all of, you know, most of your content. So are there boundaries that we draw when it comes to sex toys, the usage and, you know, the psychological and the physical part of it? You know how on a cigarette packet, it says, um, warning, this can cause cancer. Yeah. So I think that all of sex ed, um, needs to come with some kind of education, some kind of um, understanding, some kind of explanations, okay? I find that a lot of the newer sex toy manufacturers, at least in India, um, are really taking the trouble to explain this to people. They're saying that this is not your main thing. This is something that you add to your life add it to your partner pleasure etc unfortunately there are there has been a sex toy market which is not bothered with that so mm -hmm. it's run rampant and there's still a sex toy market where the people concerned are not really selling it responsibly right. and i think that's where it just comes down to again this thing of explaining we make the subject so taboo we don't talk about it. We don't bring it up. We don't um, discuss it. And then we just think that people will just know. They'll know when to stop. They'll know when to start. They'll know what's good. They'll know what's not good. And we just think that people will know. And how are people going to know? Yeah. Because we shut down every conversation that comes along. Now, there is also, it, it, okay, it's not that easy to get to a point where you totally desensitize your your genitals, it, it really isn't. I mean, you'd have to go crazy to, to get to that point. 
But that doesn't mean that people don't do it. You know, people do get to that point. Like I said, there are these sex toys, where, sex dolls, where some people are just buying the torso. So it's just that hole that they're putting it into that contracts and expands and does all of the rest of it. It's the same thing with um, the sex toys. We we don't um, we don't have lessons. I mean, just imagine, just imagine if somebody said we will do a lesson as part of sex ed on sex toys because they're becoming so easily available and young people should know about it. Can you imagine the chaos? Parents would be up in arms. Mm. And they don't understand that all they're doing is the young people are still going to do it. At least teach them that this is yeah. what's going to, tell them what could go wrong. Don't, you know, this is not about teaching them how to use it. It's about telling them what to look out for but yeah, anyway, we can't get past that, unfortunately. Um, I think that the sex toy market definitely fills a need. I think it's really important. I think it's very useful. I also know a lot of women, um, specifically women, I, I will say this is where my conversations have been, who have said that, yeah, I have a bunch of good sex toys. I use them, but it's not the same as being with somebody. Mm. So a lot of people are sensible enough to get to that point, you know, or to understand it. There's always going to be people who kind of fall over the edge into the crevice. I I wish that there was some way of, I don't know, um, sort of putting down, like, you know, even a parameter and saying, Look, this is from one to 10. If you get to this point, this is where you stop. But I think for this, unfortunately, it isn't people like, okay, people like me, particularly, if I talk about it, I get abused for it. You know, Dadi, what do you know? And so on. There's a lot of abuse. Like, what the hell do you know? I even get people saying, I know about all this. I, I don't need you to tell me. I think that it is something that sex toy manufacturers need to do. They're the ones who have to actually teach this. And I'm also thinking that just like you can detox from almost anything, it's not an easy process, it's painful, but you can detox and you can bring back a certain amount of sensitivity. I wonder whether when you get to this point with sex toys, whether that can be brought back with wow. withdrawal, et cetera. I don't know, I, I've never explored that, but it would definitely be something worth um, thinking about. It's also, it, it, it much like with the men, it's also with the women. If you get to that point where this is an easy fix, it's very difficult to give up. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense, the education part. I think a lot can be complicated through education, but I also see the obstacles that you just put in you front know, of us. So I was also planning to record this story. I do a um, series, which I haven't done for a while, called the um, uh, Wednesday Weirdness. So just really bizarre, weird stories. And this is a story about a man called Ritter, Johann Ritter. He was German. He was the guy who discovered the UV rays. So mm -hmm. very bright man, you know, um, 1800s. He decided just before that electricity, usable electricity had just been created, invented. And uh, he decided that he was going to explore how it felt on different parts of his body, including his genitals. So he would wrap up his penis in um, a, a bit of cloth soaked in lukewarm milk mm -hmm. and then give it an electric shock. And he found it so pleasurable because it would give him instant arousal and instant magical orgasms, as he called it, that he would tell people constantly, I plan to marry my Voltaic battery. Like, I'm going to marry my battery. It was that good. Anyway, he did it so much. He got so carried away with it. He did it for longer periods of time. He would, uh, there would be a lot of pain as well because of the electric current. He would take opium to dull the pain. He died by the time he was 33 because he had totally destroyed his body. He was a scientist, brilliant man. He created, um, like I said, he, he created the first dry cell battery. He discovered, UV, he discovered galvanism. Brilliant man, has nothing to do with what your brain does to you when you suddenly discover instant pleasure. 
Wow. Bad addiction. So the saying that too much of pleasure, too little of it can destroy us. Yeah, any kind of addiction where you where you become so unnatural with an addiction. Mm -hmm. You know? Wow. Seema, this question's for you. All and all of your posts, you glow. What's your routine? What's your health routine? At the end of the day, it all comes back down to health, but it shows. I'm trained to identify biofeedback because that's what we're meant to do. It would be better face-to-face, -face, but you always have a glow on your face. Your hair is healthy. You have that vitality within you that comes out so youthfully strong. I'm, I'm just curious, and I'm sure the audience is curious. What's, what's your routine? What's your food routine, your exercise? How do you look after yourself? What keeps you so young? You know, I'd love to hear about that. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm a broken, exhausted woman. Um, okay, so my, I think uh, what I have discovered over time, Luke, is that I get excited very easily. I love everything that I discover in life. It excites me. It gets me. It's it's what motivates me to wake up in the morning. A little new story, a little bit of information. I I I don't look at the world with jaded eyes as yet. Um, and I think that that is what motivates a lot of people to uh, feel better, look better. I also, many years ago, you know, we all go through this process. Um, you know, we also go through this thing. You, you grow up being a little bit left wing. I'm a diehard feminist, totally a fight for feminism and feminist rights. And we were taught a lot of the times when we were younger, you know, well, feminism is then you have to look a certain way. You know, it's not about, I, I would get criticized a lot about, you know, how I was dressed and the fact that I wanted to put on my makeup and I wanted to put on my churian. You know, this whole idea of wanting to look good for myself, like mm -hmm. just look the way, when I look in the mirror, I should be able to bring a smile to my face. I had to get past that to, um, uh, to make it okay for myself. But once I did, it just made it, made it so much easier. I, I have a lot of the problems that we as Indian women have. I have really bad facial hair, really bad. Um, I went through laser a few years ago, you know, to sort of particularly to do the really harsh black hair. I also used to, like, it was so bad, my facial hair, that I had to... Um, tweeze it twice a day mm -hmm. it was that bad and it always left a little sort of greenish mark underneath the skin you know where the next bit of hair is waiting to come out mm -hmm. yeah. it just it made me feel so insecure about myself when I was growing up I also I don't know if you can tell but I had this birthmark on my cheek and um, just as I finished college I remember going to one of the big hotel management companies in India I won't say which one to apply for a job and I was told that um, I couldn't because of this mark that they would never be able to put a woman with a mark on her face in front of their clients. So I literally grew up, I, my mother who was very, very beautiful, I would get my Punjabi aunties saying, do you understand Punjabi? Uh, well, I don't know, I don't, but please say it in Punjabi, I'm sure the audience so will get They it. would say, no, they'd say things like, Teri maa te badi sonia, te no kyo you know, your mother is so beautiful, what happened to you? So I grew up um, feeling like I was the ugliest person in the world. And I grew up thinking, okay, I'm going to just focus on studying and becoming intelligent because that's the only thing I have control over. Mm. And then mm. you get to a point where, and I think it has to be something that you do consciously for yourself, where you say, I don't care whether somebody else thinks I look good or not. I'm going to feel good for myself. And yeah, so I think that's where it comes from. My, um, I, uh, so my hair, I'm just fortunate that I decided to go gray and now it's fashionable. Yeah. <laughs> but I do make an effort to look a certain way because I like to look like this. Love that. No, I love your honesty. It just comes out in your energy. And just to let you know, I'm deep in research on longevity right now. And you know, a common point that's coming out for the healthiest, longest living, happiest people are those. There are many factors, but one of them is living in awe 
constant awe of life, curiosity. So I, I resonate with what you said that as your first point, because it is showing in you, no doubt about that. Seema, this has been amazing. Our, uh, sorry, we call it the Adbhut Rasa. You know, we have nine Rasas, nine um, things that motivate us, the, the things that make you sad. Da, 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 da. And this thing of living in awe is known as the Adbhut Rasa. And they say that Lord Shiva wears it in his head. He embodies all the rasas and he wears that on his head. And um, yeah, it says that look at every day as though you're looking through the Hubble telescope and feel in awe. That's such a beautiful thing. I love that. I love that. Seema, this has been great. But before I let you go, I have one more question. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have gone through sexual shame, maybe in past relationships, you know, breakups, guys can be nasty and just completely degrade a woman because of the hurt and pain. Girls can do that with guys as well, or for whatever reasons. How do people overcome or build, you know, confidence when it or self-esteem when it comes to sex or intimacy or relationships? It's not just about sex, especially when they've gone through shame in their past relationships or in their sex in their sexuality. What's your take? Yeah. What, what's your advice on that? It, it has to be a conscious step. You have to consciously decide that you want to overcome it and get professional help to do it. A lot of people have this tendency to say it'll pass with time. It doesn't pass with time. Okay. I just want to say, you know, we have now as a society come to a point where, you know, we, we spend a lot of money on our technology. We buy the newest phones. We like to go to the best restaurants. We spend money on designer clothes and all sorts of things. I want you to take that same amount of money and invest it in your mental health. This is part of your mental health. Your relationship is the thing that's going to stick with you for the rest of your life. All your, your relationships, all of them, not just your one relationship. That is what is going to carry you through your life. Not all the other wonderful things it's fantastic to have those but your relationship is really important invest in yourself first just get the help and get past this i find that a lot of the younger generation are very good with this they they will decide that they're feeling low about something that this is a problem they will get therapy therapy is still a bit of a stigmatized thing isn't it especially in india but um yeah get yourself consciously get yourself help because on your own, you will not get past it. So help yourself to do it. Awesome. And if if for about two to three minutes, you had the entire attention of the world on SEMA right now, what message would you leave the audience with your years of rich experience, knowledge? And of course, you're aware of everything that's going wrong in society and right in society when it comes to sex and pleasure and relationships. What's that message you would like to leave us with? So I think that we have all grown up with this, uh, men, women, everybody, with this idea that pleasure is particularly a man's privilege and not a woman's. And it's very deeply embedded. Unfortunately, even when you consciously say that's not how it is, it is very, very deeply embedded. and. I think what I would like to say actually is that each time we, yes, I talk a lot about women's pleasure because every time I talk about men's pleasure, I get told you don't have a penis, you don't have an opinion. So I'm sticking to female pleasure. Okay. But basically to say that, you know, the, the best relationships occur, the best when you want to look after your partner's pleasure when you want to do whatever you can to give each mm -hmm. other pleasure when you are at that point where you're trying to tear the other person down whether it is with your partner or the potential partner or nothing at all it's that mindset of saying but what about me um you, you know just that mindset of sort of kind of going no but why should i do that for so and so they wouldn't do it for me or whatever I just wanted to say that it's funny, most people don't realize this, but when you see your partner thoroughly pleasured and getting more excited for you, it is the biggest turn on. It's actually going to improve your pleasure. Trust me, believe me, uh, try it once just to see whether I'm right or not. 
you'll just find that your own pleasure and your desire for pleasure goes up so much more. Wow, Seema, thank you so much. We've crossed an hour and I could go on talking to you for a really long time, but this has been amazing. And I think it's inspired me, so I know it's going to inspire all of my audience. I really appreciate your honesty, your simplicity. Everything you said was so real. And honestly, that's what I want my podcast to be real, because there are enough of people out there preaching about what people should do and not do. But every message of yours is empowering us to think differently. And all I can say is thank you so much. This has been amazing. Thank you for having me, Luke. It's been lovely chatting to you. Thank you, Sima. Thank you. Stay tuned for more. We're going to continue our journey learning, sharing, and evolving.